I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight TV, we're venturing into the depths of space with an amazing author. His name is Dale Chamberlain, and he has written a powerful book. It is called Oasis 4. This thrilling space station saga, set at a bustling galactic crossroads, invites readers into a universe where commerce, trade, and intrigue all collide. Managed by Phil Ross, Oasis 4 serves as a pivotal hub for Stellar Logistics and Freight Corporation, but its prime location makes it a magnet as well for perilous adventures and shadowy dealings. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Dale, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Oh, nice to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Tell us what inspired you to choose a space station at a galactic crossroads as a setting for Oasis 4. I, well, I, I really want to write a short story. And one, one of the ones I had in mind was... Uh, I want to highlight, you know, what a space station manager would go through in a, in a given day. And, um, you know, of course, he didn't have any support system. If he was near a planet or something, he could he could get support. But if he's out there all alone or, you know, his station is, is isolated, then uh, then it's all on him. You know, he would he has to deal with his problems with what he has. So that was really the impetus for uh, really locate the station at, at such a distance from anything. Gotcha, gotcha. Let's give the folks at home an overview. Tell them what Oasis 4 is about. Uh, well, like I said, it started out as a short story. I want to write just a short story about a given day. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's the space station manager has, you know, the things he has to deal with. And I, I did that and I enjoyed it so much that I said, you know what, I, I got another story I can use these same characters. And I would I took what was happening previous and I built on that. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, uh, there's a, I, I could probably add a little bit more to this story. And uh, I says, you know, so a lot of the answers or, you know, things that questions weren't answered in the first two stories and I could, I could at least build on those mm -hmm. and it just snowballed. It, it yeah. became its own monster. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to, uh, you know, once I finished one story, it's well, okay, I've got these others that I have to resolve. And like I said, it's, it became its own monster. And I, it was actually a lot of fun to write. I'm sure. I'm sure. Cause it's taking on a life of its own. You're inventing as you go along and you're living in that imaginary world at the same time, which is kind of cool because you're visualizing it, you're picturing it, which comes across because um, a lot of your descriptions are very visual. Have you envisioned this as a movie or a series or something like that? The thought had crossed my mind. Yeah. Um, more of a series, I would think. Um, or or a, series of, a series of movies, I, you mm -hmm. know, kind of like... Uh, Oh, Tom Selleck in uh, the Stone Cold series. You yeah, know, you know that that comes to mind. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't throw my throw in. Uh, I wouldn't exactly say that this Harry Potter quality, but <laughs> right. it could be. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fantasy, uh, science fi fiction, and fantasy are closely related, so that's for sure. And I think the adventures. Uh, on Oasis 4 are limitless, that's for sure. Who would you have play Phil Ross? You know, I always thought that uh, Phil Ross had kind of Drew Carey's personality. Cool. That's 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 who, you know, who he comes across and uh in my in my mind. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a, his that that personality set. Yeah, I can uh, see that like a nice guy, a funny guy, you know, a get it done guy. Right. Yeah, kind of, you know, uh, Kind of deadpan, but he had comedic chops. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that sounds great. Now, I see a lot of pictures of uh, cockpits and other sci-fi memorabilia behind you. Tell me a little bit about your influences when it comes to writing these types well, of books. I come, I come from an aviation background. 
Oh. Uh, in fact, right now we're at the Ann Arbor Airport at the University of Michigan Flyers huh. uh, Flying Club. Uh, I'm the uh, director of maintenance. I, I've uh, a career aircraft mechanic. Cool. I'm also a pilot, but uh, air, aircraft maintenance is where I make my living. And uh, this is actually one of the study carols, you know, for uh, our uh, student pilots and instructors to get together for, you know, in-flight or after-flight debriefings, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Uh, so I, I kind of want to hit some of the, the aerospace things in the book. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of areas I could have delved into, like the, the interaction between pilots and mechanics. You know, there's always a little bit of friction there. I, I could have gotten into that a little bit. I, I, maybe I did the first story in Oasis 4, but uh, a, a little bit. But uh, I, yeah, maybe, maybe next book. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's cool. It's cool you have a background in aviation, and it kind of shows in your work. Um, you obviously have taken it to the next level. Um, when do you think we'll get to the point where uh, space stations are not just for astronauts coming and going and exploring and giving, uh, making scientific experiments, but rather, you know, actually offloading and unloading and becoming wave stations for other spacecraft? Uh, in other words, using space for commerce. Yeah. Uh, if Elon Musk has anything to say about it, probably the next couple of years. Right. <laughs> You know, he's, uh, or, you know, him or people like him, uh, you know, he's, he's really, in, in my opinion, he's really taken things to uh, years ahead of, you know, what NASA's schedule would be. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he's definitely a visionary and uh, he's done amazing things from the rocket launches to the electric car to these um, tubes and trains he wants to build underground. And, and now yeah, you said, of course. That was one of the things about, you know, about space. The reason why I didn't, uh, oh, in Star Trek, they were all explorers. And uh, Star Wars, it was all this space magic. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if you go out in space, what, what would the point be to extract materials you know, for commerce? Right. And uh, if we do colonize any worlds out there, uh, there would have to be a certain amount of that. There would also have to be a, a huge leap in technology before any of that happens. Yeah. Um, and physicists keep talking about, oh, let's you know, let's invent light speed uh, engines, and I don't know how that's going to work out. I think we're I think we're a couple centuries from that, personally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Although, look how this last. Uh you know, 20 years has advanced. We've gone. That's from, true. That's very you know, true. Barely imagining this to this running our lives to AI. So, you know, yeah. it, uh, it seems like it's an ex exponential explosion of information technology and uh, development right now, which is wonderful. Um, that, was, well. you know, that was one of the things that um, when, when I was, a, when I was a little boy, you know, it was the, space was a thing. Apollo was uh Right, the Apollo programs, the moon landings, and all that, and a lot of our toys were, you know, rockets and things like that. And, oh, I remember in Cub Scouts, he'd open a Boys Life magazine, and it would be a, there'd be stories in there about our life in space in twenty years, you know, and they had, you know, moon bases and you know Mars bases and people, you know, uh, astronaut miners and things like that, and that was that was. Pretty exciting, you know. That's yeah. when you're a kid, you're like, "Wow, that's going to be pretty cool." To do all right. that when I grow up, but and so that was really the reason why I uh, uh, one of the things, you know, that that got you know, Oasis Four going. I think, yeah, in my head. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Back back a little bit. <laughs> Are you more of a, a Star Trek guy or more of a Star Wars guy or a I like a Star I like Galactica? I, I like them both. Um, yeah. I don't want to start no arguments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I enjoy watching them both. Um, yeah. they, they have, they both have their, their pluses and minuses. Yeah. You know, exactly. Uh, exactly. One of the things that's interesting about Oasis four is the station's role as a hub for quote unquote, less than legitimate activity. It adds this layer of suspense and danger. Tell us about, you know, weaving these elements into the storyline without giving away the uh, station's primary purpose. 
Well, it's kind of like having an open, uh, like, like a town in the middle of the desert, you know, it's, right. uh, it's, but it, where, where they get the name Oasis, you know, it's, um, uh, uh it, it's a, it's a place that you can get refuge and, uh, supplies in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's yeah. the same with an oasis in the, in the desert, but, uh, yeah, well, less than legitimate people are always looking for places to, to do business. So, yeah. um, unless they're known criminals, they can come aboard this space station and, you know, and do their, uh, you know, have their little clandestine meetings or, or whatever. You know, it, 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 you notice that it, there's a security team, if you read the book. Mm -hmm. uh, if, they're pretty good at uh, they're pretty good at sussing out criminals. So you know that's yeah. they can't do any criminal activity while on the station, but they can sure plan stuff. Right. You know, as they as they found out, yeah. Well, actually, there was one character did find out that uh, criminal activity was dealt with rather harshly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Tell the folks at home what the main um, conflict of the story is. Well, the main conflict is they do discover uh, that there's, you know, by, de with, by dealing with some of these criminals that they that have come aboard the station, they discover that uh, there's a, a, a fairly active slave trade out there. It's been, in, in the story, it's, they know that there's a slave trade out there, but they don't know how extensive it is. Hmm. So that they, um, they do get involved in breaking up the slave trade and that's the main you know that's that's one of the main um, uh, objectives of the book that and one of the one of the purveyors of the slave trade is uh, the enthusiastic purveyors is a criminal syndicate and they're just known as the syndicate they're from different worlds and they're all kind of loosely associated with each other they help each other out uh, but you know the the slave traders, the, the people that go and kidnap mm. uh, people for the slave trade are, are members of the syndicate. So breaking them up uh, becomes a, a priority, yeah. particularly for one planet. Uh, one of the uh, former did they do? There there is a, a planetary invasion, which I go in the book. I say you know these. A, a planet is kind of an impossible thing to evade. To um, it's just logistically horribly difficult, but they manage it and they they free the slaves of this planet. But they they do have this one girl. Uh, she she was a slave. They have to get her. She can't go back to her home planet because the syndicate. Well, you know, if they find out she's even been free, it'll be rough on her family. Mm. So. You know, just to, just to send her a message, keep your keep your mouth shut, or you know, bad things will happen. So they have to work on getting her back to her planet somehow. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they have to uh, make sure that the local syndicate branch that uh, kidnapped her in the first place or sold her to slave in the first place gets wiped out. And I'm not going to. I'm you not going to give it all it. away. It, yep. It's um. It, it's it, I'll, I'll just say it's very satisfying. Um, yeah. writing about people and getting what have, they have coming to them. Exactly. <laughs> and a exactly. lot of people think it's fun to, you know, fun to read, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is there a message you'd like readers to take away from the story? I don't think so. I, it's, it's More just, entertainment? Uh, it's just a fun thing to read. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, I'm not, it's not allegorical or anything like that. It's, oh, he's trying to no. <laughs> uh, just trying to entertain and uh, put a good that's story. That's all I want there. to do. Entertain. If it, if it promotes thought, well, that's fine too. But, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Are you working on a sequel? Not for Oasis Four, no. No. Uh, I think I think I've taken that as far as I wanted to. Uh, I do have other books in mind. You know, not not science fiction, but you know, other subjects. I, I think it maybe historical fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, might be fun there. I live in the Great Lakes area. There's a lot of stories I think would, yeah. that are kind of interesting. That I can tell them from a third person point of view while they have their own adventure. That that yeah. might be kind of fun. I don't know. 
Yeah. That's I have to think about it. But I have, a, I have other ideas. Yep. Are you actively working on one right now, or are you just kind of mulling around the ideas? Uh, mulling around the ideas. I did write a couple of short stories. Uh, I was, one of my goals to put out a book of just short stories. Mm-hmm. Dif- different subjects. You know, if they make you think, that's great. If not, you know, they're there to entertain. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for I know you said this book started as a short story, then became like a little bit longer, a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Tell us about the writing process. How long overall did it take you? And what was it like living in that world while you were creating it? Uh, well, I started about uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. And I finished it you know, last year. Uh, you know, it was uh, oh, living in that, in that world. I did try not to live in that world. That's <laughs> that's a sign to see your saddle starting to slip. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I would sometimes write myself into a corner. Right. Say, oh, geez, how do I get out of this? And uh, over to, over a weekend, you know, I'd have to I'd have to drive about an hour. Mm-hmm. Actually, I drive from my parents' house to my house and back to my uh, my parents' house, and I would use that time to think about what, what I'm going to write about next, mm-hmm. and uh, you know how I'm going to write out of that corner. And, uh, what's the next part of the story? You know what's interesting, and uh, you know, then I'd go home and I'd write a page or two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And it took you about a year or two to write the whole thing? A couple of years, yeah. A couple of years, yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Did you have this world in mind when you were writing it? Like, did it purely come out of your imagination or was it inspired by something? Or tell us a little bit about that. Uh, There was one episode of Star Trek where it was Star Trek Voyager. Mm-hmm. Where they had they stopped at a space station that was an alien space station, and they dealt with the manager, and uh, he he seemed kind of busy. But that was about the extent of the inspiration. Yeah. I think, I, you know, I, I I didn't want it to, I didn't want it to be uh, derivative from Star Trek, right? You know, I, I wanted it to be my own. Yeah, and I. I I just got to thinking, well, what would we do in space? You know, and I actually had, I had a hard time, you know, if, do I want aliens in my story or do I want just all humans? Personal opinion, I don't think there's aliens out there. Hmm. You know, uh, I know a lot of people are going to be, you know, hating me for, for saying that. <laughs> but, uh, well, we're not going to leave them in my lifetime, I don't think anyway. But anyway, I, I thought, well, gee, do I want to just have a bunch of human colonies out there that we're trained with, or do I want aliens? I decided on aliens because uh, you can get a lot of fun, quirky personalities out of it without right. upsetting people, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, but personally, you feel like we're here by ourselves. That even though that there's millions of planets around us, we're the only one that's inhabited. Yeah, that's. that's that's my opinion. I know yeah. it's not a popular opinion, but there's even some physicists um, that say you know, how exceptionally rare it is to have the conditions here on Earth to support life. Mm. Um, and I guess even mathematically, given the size of the universe, it's you know the numbers are pretty small, and you know how uh, how common that would be. And it's yeah. not com- you know it's not common at all because. So very specific things have, have to happen to support life. Yeah, on, on exactly. Planet, you know. Yeah, or life as we know it, unless yeah, it's the kind of know, life yeah. that lives on uh, methane uh, or... That I don't want to get involved with. <laughs> yeah, some other kind of uh, substance. I thought it was always intriguing that uh, Stephen Hawking, who is considered one of the great thinkers of our time, said that if there are aliens out there, that they will kill us, that they are a threat, which is uh, kind of frightening. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know where, where he gets that idea, but... Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, we never met one, so how does he know? I and, know, I know, but I guess fact, that's I guess that's his hypothesis. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. But as, you know, when I wrote this book, I said, you know what? Every science fiction that piece that I've ever read where there's aliens, the humans are always the the guys that are going, well, geez, we're going to get wiped out here. We're weak. We're you know. Right. I thought, well, what if the aliens look at humans like I don't know about these guys. <laughs> And, uh, and when, when we invaded a planet, you know, the aliens are kind of looking at us. Well, we sent we sent a bunch of army rangers over there, and yeah. the aliens are kind of looking at us, going, "Oh my gosh!" You know, <laughs> uh, the, you know, they they spread the rumor. The humans are kind of a warrior race. Yeah, and, and of course they're like, "Well, we haven't done it. We haven't threatened anybody. Well, look at look how you act when you go to war." You know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, look no further than this planet to realize that uh, beware the beast man. He among, yeah. uh, he alone uh, kills his own. Do you remember that from uh, uh, Planet of the Apes, perhaps? It was oh, one, yeah. One yeah. of the sacred scrolls, beware of the beast man. Yeah, I do, I do remember that. It's been, pleasure been a while and, sport it. and kills one of his own, yep. Well, Dale Chamberlain is an emerging and creative uh, science fiction force to deal with. He has written a terrific book. It is called Oasis 4. It is a thrilling space station saga set at a bustling galactic crossroads. He invites readers into a universe where commerce, trade, and intrigue all collide. It's managed by Bill Ross, and Oasis 4 serves as a pivotal hub for stellar logistics and freight corporation, but its prime location also makes it a magnet for trouble. Dale takes us behind the scenes, as he did just now, in creating this interstellar outpost, revealing his inspirations, challenges, and surprises of crafting a cosmos teeming with life and complexity. Did you find anything truly challenging, Dale, when you were writing this? Are you like, I know you said yeah, a couple of times you painted yourself into a corner. Uh, some of the math was difficult to work out, you know, mm -hmm. as trying to work out uh, light years and, uh, you know, multiples of light speed. And all. And I, you know, I just had to trust that, you know, someone's not going to, you know, nitpick it apart. You know, I, I did the best I could, but that was really the most difficult part was just coming up with the math for some of this yeah. stuff and describing, you know, light speed, you know, what's happens there. And I just left it as vague as possible. You just, trust me that it's going to work <laughs> exactly let, let our brains fill in the blanks dale wonderful job thank you so much for joining us here today on spotlight well, thanks for having me my it's pleasure great to meet you great to meet you as well sir and to the folks at home i'm logan crawford thanking you for your time this time until next time on spotlight